Well, good morning, and thank you very much indeed for that, uh, for that kind introduction. It's a very great pleasure to be back here in the Gulf among friends. I was here uh, last October for the JITEX uh, fair, trade fair and conference uh, to discuss the digital revolution from the opportunities of big data to the challenges of cybersecurity. This time, we're talking about the future of government services, and digital is crucial to that, although there are many other ingredients. In the UK, public sector reform has been an immediate response to the urgent need that the current government faced when it came into office in 2010. But there's a greater prize at stake. We need to reduce the deficit, but we also have the chance to create 21st century services, cost-effective, sustainable for the future, but also faster and more responsive to people's needs. No two countries have exactly the same experience, but around the world, governments are facing the same challenges of squeezed budgets, low, rising expectations, and what's been a period of low economic growth. So we need a new paradigm for government services, one that delivers better services, focus on user need at much lower cost, and in a way that supports economic growth rather than being a drag on it, as has too often been the case in the past. The challenge of meeting a budget deficit gives a government a clear choice. You can go down the path of indiscriminate, salami-sized cuts to frontline services, and that's the soft option, the line of least resistance. It's simpler for the bureaucrat. The bureaucrat doesn't have to face the political consequences of service cuts. But the second is the high road, the high road of cutting the government's own costs and driving innovation and change. And that's the way to go. That's what we're doing in the UK. It's tough. It means unrelenting, hard, practical work. But it can bring about lasting and dramatic change. All around the world, I've seen governments wrestling with the same problems. I've seen how Singapore's Public Service 21 program encourages staff to question assumptions and to always be seeking new ways of doing things. I saw in India how the importance of improving civil service capability through training is uh, gaining momentum. In South Korea and Estonia, leading the way in digital, I asked uh, the Prime Minister of Estonia, which is a world leader in e-government, why they went down this path. And he said, when we became an independent country 20 years ago, we had two advantages. He said we had no legacy because the Russians had taken everything with them, and we had no money. So I said, well, we've replicated the second of those conditions, that we have quite a lot of legacy. And that's a part of the problem all governments have to deal with. So we have a long history in the UK of cooperation, friendship, and very open dialogue with our partners in the Gulf. And while there's no single formula for success, especially in a region with distinct cultures and differing political systems, there's still a huge amount we can learn from each other about the future of government. What I'm going to talk about today is the five principles that characterize the Britain's approach to public service reform since the coalition government was formed in May 2010. I want to stress that we didn't start with those principles. We started not with the theory, but with the practice of making changes in order to test what worked and what didn't work. These principles that I'm going to set out 
uh, are distilled from that practice and from that experience. And I stress again, they're pragmatic. They're not ideological. They, I think, can be of widespread application for governments of all types, whether from the right or the center or the left. We all face the same challenges, and we can all learn from each other's experiences. So the five principles. The first is openness. Using transparency and open data to bring about continuous improvement can help governments to address rising public demand and the challenges of uh, austerity. It won't always be comfortable. It takes Transparency takes governments, whether bureau, bureaucrats or uh, politicians, it takes us out of the comfort zone. It makes us accountable in real time on a daily basis. It exposes waste and taxpayers and citizens are able to see exactly how their money is being spent. It sharpens accountability. It informs choice for the citizens over their public services. And combined with ever-increasing technological cap capability, it'll create more accountable, more efficient and effective governments. Open data is also a raw material for economic growth. It's the new more raw material of the 21st century. It supports the creation of new markets, new jobs, and new businesses. We've committed to enhancing the scope, breadth, and usability of published data, which will help stimulate greater diversity in government suppliers, so contracts being published uh, online. Last year, G8 governments came together under our presidency to agree a landmark open data charter. It sets principles for the release and the reuse of data and for its accessibility. Having these principles on openness is a critical element in encouraging growth and ensuring consistency, helping governments and businesses to operate more closely together. Transparency is an idea whose time has come. It's the friend of the reformer. And we need to go beyond open data to that culture of openness where governments become better <coughs> at being open about the things that aren't working. Too often, the first instinct of governments uh, is to hide what hasn't worked. Uh, and being open about it, being transparent, builds trust in our citizens. So openness, the first principle, it's fundamental. The second principle is that tight control from the center over common activities like property, IT projects, procurement, particularly of common goods and services, of management information on a consistent basis across the government, oversight of major projects, again, on a consistent basis to drive up quality and assurance. All of this reduces costs, but it also uh, encourages collaborative working. Back in 2010, when our government was formed, the UK government was spending four pounds for every three pounds in revenue. Uh, we were having to borrow one pound in every four, 25% of our spending, and we couldn't carry on like that. We were wasting billions of pounds on a wasteful uh, consultancy, superfluous advertising and marketing, and projects which were out of hand, IT contracts, IT contracts which were too expensive uh, and too opaque. And no cross-government effort was being made to get to grips with the billions lost every year to fraud and error and uncollected debt. Many of the fundamental components of efficient management and effective oversight had been absent. So within days of coming to office, we introduced tough spending controls from the center on discretionary spend uh, in, uh, in central government departments. We started renegotiating contracts with our biggest suppliers, dealing with them as a single customer across government instead of allowing them to play off the suppliers to play off different parts of government against each other. We've reduced uh, by the size of the civil service by more than 15%, and that's meant we've been able to vacate surplus properties and save money that way. 
So we've created something that had been lacking in government for too long, a strong corporate center. We know, call it the Efficiency and Reform Group, and working closely with our finance ministry, the Treasury, we've driven down the costs of government. It works across artificial departmental boundaries to implement cross-government solutions to cross-government problems. It's about making government work like the best-run businesses, ensuring that every penny of taxpayers' money is used to maximum effect. As a result of those controls, that approach, we've saved in our first year nearly four billion pounds, in our second, five and a half billion pounds, our third, we saved over 10 billion pounds, and we're hoping in the year that's drawing towards an end that we will save in excess of 13 billion pounds. So that's the second principle, tight control over cross-government common uh, activities. The third is the converse of that, looseness. We uh, need to find different ways of operating, of delivering services at the front line. And that means that tight control over the center has to be matched by looser control over operations. Spin-outs and services commissioned from outside the public sector should become increasingly the norm. These days, public service mutuals, spin-outs from the public sector, joint ventures, social enterprises and charities are attractive alternatives to the old binary choice between delivering services in-house with monolithic monopoly government services or on the alternative full red-blooded privatization and outsourcing. That was a stagnant, rigid, unimaginative model which stifled innovation. So we're breaking that public sector monopoly over service provision. We already have uh, around 80 live and staff-owned mutuals. Uh, up from just nine in 2010, they have responsibility for over a billion pounds worth of services, everything from libraries, healthcare, social care, uh, a, a wide range of public services. They're owned by the staff to a greater or lesser extent and have that powerful sense of ownership which is so engaging and so uh, motivating. Everyone has an incentive to make it work. Most of these mutuals have chosen, the staff themselves have chosen that the enterprise should be not for profit. And yet the incentive to drive productivity, to save money, to be able to put the money back into the service is powerful. It frees public service workers to do their job as they know best, because the people who know best aren't the politicians or the bureaucrats, they're those who deliver services at the front line. Whenever I ask people who work in public service mutuals, would they go back and work for the council, the municipality, the health authority, the government department, they always say no. I ask them, why not? They say, because we can do things. We're, not, uh, we're free to see what needs to be done and simply act on it and make it happen. It's a liberating, empowering form. So when this public service ethos is married to entrepreneurialism, it can be an incredibly powerful force. It's part of that mindset which elevates the service that the public receives above the structure that delivers it. So that's the third principle, delivering services away from government, away from the public sector, uh, but for uh, the public, empowering frontline workers to deliver it in the way they know best. The fourth principle is about digital. If a service can be delivered online, or mo through mobile, it should be delivered only online. That's the approach which is guiding the transformation of 25 of the largest transactional government services in the UK. So the 
simpler, clearer, faster, and more, most importantly, designed around the needs of the users. Every surplus page, every unnecessary question can be another dead end for an angry, frustrated, and confused service user. So by digital by default, we mean creating digital services that are so straightforward, so compelling, that all of those who can use them will choose to do so. And those who can't are given the support that they need. It's an iterative process, building and testing the application in small chunks, working quickly to make improvements, always, constantly, in real time, testing the application with real users so it can be refined and distilled as it goes along. The feedback continues, and so do the refinements. And over time, the services evolve to keep pace with new demands. And these applications will therefore always be a work in progress. There will never be a time when they are complete, because there will always be opportunities to improve and refine and develop. And of course, we can make massive savings as we do that. In the past, governments seldom, if ever, consulted people about the services they were using. It was a big bang approach, a big procurement, a hire a multinational supplier uh, to build an application. Suddenly, that's launched on the public and expectations uh, were uh, hurtling down a black hole along with the money that paid for it. The first the public would see of a service was when it went live, by which time it would be too late to make changes. That's the wrong way to do it. Only when you find out what people want, how they want it delivered, and how they intend to use it, do you even begin to think about designing the service or building the technology. Digital public services can stimulate, as they do now, a generation of world-beating software and service businesses. By committing to open standards and open source software, governments can create a more open market for IT suppliers, increasing competition, lowering licensing costs, and advancing uh, innovation. And the costs can come dramatically down. We estimate that the cost of an online transaction is a 20th of the cost of it being done by phone, a 30th by post, and a 50th, just 2% of the cost of the service being delivered face to face. So huge savings and delivering services in the way that our citizens want them to be delivered. So they can transact with government in a way and at a time of their choosing, not in a way that suits the government. So that's the fourth principle, digital, digital by default. And the fifth is about the culture in the public service. And that's about innovation. I've talked about the new ways of doing things, new models of delivery, digital, new approach to openness and transparency. But it requires the right skills and the right culture within the public service. Public servants have to be given the flexibility being given permission to try new things, to be tolerated when they don't work, as some of them won't work, to surface them and ensure that the organization learns from the experience. The best organizations learn at least as much from the things that don't work as they do from the things that do work. And if you, haven't, if you never have something that goes wrong, you're not trying new things. So a culture that supports innovation, that supports experimentation, with that open culture that welcomes people who say, we tried this, it didn't work, we stopped doing it, and we learned from it. That's a culture that governments have to embrace. And we politicians can be very bad at that. It's quite difficult for politicians to stand up and say, we got this wrong. But if we don't do that when things go wrong, and there isn't a country in the world, there isn't an organization, a business, no organization anywhere where nothing ever goes wrong. And we build trust by saying, we innovated, we tried things, not all of them worked, as long as we learn from it. And that's the open culture, the innovative culture that we have to bring. Risk and recklessness are not the same thing. Risk 
if managed properly, can be pioneering, original, and transformative. So that's the culture we need, more open, less bureaucratic, focused on the delivery of outcomes, not on the process or the structures, and too often we do that, where people feel able to challenge in the organization, to challenge each other, challenge their superiors, and the, so the status quo receives the same scrutiny. We challenge the, scrut the, the status quo in the same way as we're too prone to challenge to death new ideas and any changes. Where public servants are given the training and the skills they need, too often when things go wrong, we've entrusted capable public servants with tasks of great complexity without equipping them with the knowledge and the skills they need to discharge it. So we need commercial skills. We need uh, so that public servants feel confident commissioning services from the private and the voluntary sector to manage the spin-outs that I've talked about. The digital skills needed to design services around user need, which is a completely different mindset from what we've too often used. The leadership skills necessary to embrace these changes because the change will be constant to deliver pub priorities and projects on time and on budget. All institutions have to keep pace with changing circumstances. The best organizations continually seek to improve themselves. And in the public sector, success has to be measured not in staff numbers or hours worked or in spreadsheets and emails, but by the answer to the question, how has my work today helped people? So open, tight, loose, digital, innovative. These are what I believe should be the five principles of productive, effective, and successful governments now and in the future. But this is a race with no finishing line. We will never be able to say mission accomplished or job done. The work of making government more efficient and more effective never ends because no organization ever achieves a perfect pitch of efficiency and effectiveness. All organizations are either getting better or they're getting worse. There's no in-between, there's no steady state. If you think you're staying the same, actually you're getting worse. So where we have expertise and experience, we want to share that. We want to, we ourselves need to improve hugely. The more work we do on public service reform, the more we see can be done, the more efficiency we see can be delivered yet. We want to learn from others, and we want to share our learning with others. And I look forward to the further discussions today. To finish with, I'm going to show you a short uh, video about our digital work, which we're proud of, but again, I stress, we're in the early stages of. Thank you very much.